And there came a day, a day like no other, when the horror genre stood threatened by the forces of evil. On that day, the horror show with Brian Keene was born. Brian Keene, Mary San Giovanni, Dave Thomas, Matt Wilderson, along with occasional co-hosts Kelly Owen, Phoebe, and Dungeon Master 77.1, these ambassadors of horror stand at the door, bringing you the biggest names in the business, as well as tomorrow's superstars. Now, here they are, The Horror Show with Brian Keene. And welcome back once again to The Horror Show with Brian Keene, except... That it's not the horror show with Brian Keene today. It's the horror show without Brian Keene because Brian Keene is taking the week off to work on the 100th episode of Defenders Dialogue, another podcast that he co-hosts. So you are stuck with the lunatics running the asylum. Uh, I'm Mary San Giovanni, also known as The Professor. We also have magical and mystical Matt Wilderson. Hello. We have dangerous Dave Thomas. I am going to derail this podcast so bad it's not even funny. <laughs> and captivating Kelly Owen. Oh, captivating. I was wondering where you're going to go when you got to me. <laughs> Dave and I are going to have a wonderful time today. Yes, we are. <laughs> can't imagine. Yeah, I can't imagine this going wrong at all. I, as I said on uh, Twitter yesterday, I said, I'm sure we'll all be behaving in a very professional manner all day Absolutely. today. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Right. Nothing will happen. Oh, I forgot to get a horn, though. Remember, we were going to have a honky horn. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's there. Is that your face? <laughs> I can do it with my face. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest thing ever. <laughs> all right. Every I'm going to clip him saying I could do it with my face and make that, that the tone that he <laughs> uses when... <laughs> Do it with my face. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to make that the sound it makes when he texts me. <laughs> Excellent. Come on, see, that was funny. See, folks, there's there's going to be a, a whole range of talent and and excitement and total shenanigans going on today. <laughs> yeah, who, who's ever left episode. to listen to it at this point in the game? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm telling you right now, this is be the most popular episode. It's going to be the greatest <laughs> Uh, as our first news item, and this is this is our we have we have some sad news, some happy news, and then some sad news again. Uh, we'll start with the <laughs> recent and unfortunate passing of author Joseph S. Pulver. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was quite an accomplished cosmic horror author. He was born July fifth, nineteen fifty five, in. Schenectady, New York. I hope I said I never say Schenectady right. Um, he was an author, a poet, an editor. Much of his work fell into the genres of uh, horror, noir fiction, hard boiled, and dark fantasy. He's perhaps best known to us for his work in cosmic horror and weird fiction, and for his love of and knowledge of Robert Chambers' The King in Yellow. Uh, Joe started his publishing career in the early 90s with a number of short stories published in various American small press magazines. Uh, his professional novel debut was a Lovecraftian novel called Nightmare's Disciple. And he's be- been published by a lot of small presses that we know. Uh, Hippocampus Press, Lovecraft Ezine, Mnemonymous. Uh, his short fiction has been in numerous anthologies in the U.S., U.K., France, Japan, and some of the anthologies we've discussed before that he had work in Black Wings, New Tales of Lovecraftian Horror, The Tindalos Mythos, Spawn of the Green Abyss, The Book of Ebon. Uh, He's had nearly two dozen short works of his translated into French and Japanese. Um, He was also the editor of Midnight Shambler, Tales Tales of Lovecraftian Horror. Uh, He was co-editor for Crypt of Cthulhu. Uh, he he did a lot of editing of collections for other authors like Ann K. Schwader. Uh, most recently, um, I forget. I'm sorry. He did most recently. It was uh, he, but he has done, he's done work for other authors. He's done editing for um, John Ford. Uh, he edited a season in Carcosa, an anthology of new tales based on The King in Yellow for Miskatonic River Press. Uh, he 
edited the award-winning anthology The Grim Scribes Puppets, a tribute to Thomas Ligotti. He was guest editor on Lovecraft Easy and The King in Yellow. I mean, the man's uh, – the works that he's done just go on and on and on. I mean, he really was an incredibly uh, – involved and accomplished man, uh, particularly in any, you know, in cosmic art. He edited around Robin for the Lovecraft arts and sciences council. Uh, he was a, a, an award winner. He won the Shirley Jackson award in 2013 for the Grim scribes puppets. He won a Bram Stoker award the same year for uh, the same, the same anthology, the Grim scribes puppets he won a World Fantasy Award in 2016 and a Shirley Jackson Award in 2016. Uh, he lived in Germany. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away from COPD in a German hospital on April 24th. He is survived by wife, Katrin, and missed by numerous friends and loved ones. Our sympathies go out to his family and friends, the people who loved him, and uh, the genre I feel really lost a, a significant significant contributor to the overall body of work. So our deepest sympathies go out to the people who knew Joe and uh, we're very sorry to hear of his passing. Yeah. Anybody have anything else to add? No, Anyone? I mean, I, I never Anyone? met the man, but I definitely read some of his work over the years and you know, he, he will be missed. He was quite the talented writer. Yeah. I mean, it's always sad to uh, lose somebody so prolific in the fields of, you know, right. especially cosmic horror as well, because I feel like they're kind of dwindling. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of the old guard I think is, is starting to, to get up there in, in years. And, um, you know, it's interesting because as far as cosmic horror goes, it's, I kind of thought it was, it was a fairly common term in, in terms of, uh, genre. Of of you know how the people understood it as a subgenre, but it's still relatively new. It's still a relatively new subgenre, uh, in, in name wise. You know, people I guess still think of it as weird fiction. So anytime I can bring light to cosmic horror and and the people who are out there creating it and doing such a great job with it, you know, I'm I'm happy to do so. Yeah. So we have some other news items. We have. Should we do the good news or the bad news first? What should we give people? The bad. Uh, I th it's the bad. You want bad? Okay. I yeah, thought we just we should did end bad. on the good. Yeah, no, do the bad news. To get all the bad news out of the way because the Dave and I can use our black humor to get us back where we belong. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Okay. Um, I know my job is here. So I'm assuming <laughs> we're going to talk about the Barnes and Noble thing. Yes. Yes. The Barnes and Noble thing. So basically, it uh, was recently announced that the Barnes and Noble would be. We've already noted. We already know that they shuttered over five hundred of their six hundred bookstores. Now they're no longer going to be ordering new magazines, and they're going to cease carrying magazines altogether, which is you know bad for a lot of small press magazines. That, you know, rely on that money coming in first to kind of keep their, you know, circulations going. Um, but it's also, I mean, just, it, it's kind of sad. It's, it's just like another, I think, another rung get, you know, of the ladder that the, the fiction is getting knocked down. What do you guys think? For, like, my first thought is, uh, it's another rung where if you're an independent, uh, writer or, you know, these smaller companies that do magazines, this is another stab in your back. Because, mm -hmm. yeah. like, you know, magazines like Cosmo and all, you know, those bigger ones, they they probably could give two shits if Barnes and Nobles are carrying their magazines anymore because hey, they, they have millions of other places. What's that, Kelly? And they rely on subscription. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're more worried about subscription, just sending it direct to the customer that wants it. They don't really care about a newsstand, essentially, to put the magazine on. But right. the smaller guy who can't do the subs like that, they need that stand. That's and, true. And I think that there's there's just this weird for those of us, I'm looking at you, Mary, who came in when you were supposed to do things a certain way. You were supposed to get into print, not mm -hmm. e you were supposed right. to get in with, you know, 
the big five, not some of the online. There was supposed to be a physical copy of what you've done. Right. right. And while I will not disparage easings because they've gotten really, really, really much better in the last 10, 15 years, we still need those physical magazines, especially in the short story market. You know, right. not Cosmo, right. maybe, but for short stories, I mean, we need those. And if you can't get them and you have to go online, then you run into the problem of, unless they're all in some central location like god forbid amazon and you can type in horror magazine unless you know absolutely everything that's out there you don't know that they're there which was the beauty of the bookstore mark you know magazine right. you could just go and you could and okay just think christmas time at christmas when you're doing stockings or whatever and you've got nine different people in your house with nine different things that they're into and one of those staples every year is we go to Barnes and Noble and we go look at the magazines and get everyone the latest copy of something that looks cool. Whether yeah. they're into quilting or horror stories or whatever. And now Honestly, that's just gonna be gone. That's that was one of the first uh avenues that I discovered that gave me the idea that people actually wrote for a living. Like that's like I didn't know you could do that, that you could write stories and submit to, until I saw them on the books, you know, on the, like, you know, we talk, you talk about how, you know, we're, we're told, you know, we were, we were sort of instructed to do things a certain way. Mm -hmm. We were also instructed to build a name for ourselves by submitting short stories to these markets. And for, for a lot of people, I think who are writing full time or even part time, uh, short story sales, uh, kind of keep us going, and I, I, I just I worry that a lot of magazines that can't weather like the financial hit from this because uh, that they're going to close down. And we're already on shaky ground with small press magazines to begin with. We already oh lose God. them so so much faster than we ought to. Um, and because you know you think too, like Cosmo, you would think to to look for maybe at a Walmart or a Target. But you don't necessarily think to buy fiction magazines, except no. at a bookstore. You yeah. know, so it just—I—I—I yeah. it, it, I, I worry about how that's going to impact uh, the small press short story fiction market. I think that's not good for us. You know, and then at the same time, you've also got this younger generation that's coming up, and they're all about saving the planet. And I'm all about saving the planet, so I'm not going to disparage that. But you know, are they going to try to get us more towards you know? easings look at it online read it mm -hmm. online don't kill a tree don't make paper out of it don't put it but they did ebooks thinking that that was going to happen and uh i don't know how to break this to you but the paperback is alive and well yeah this is true this is true i mean that would make sense i, I would think, think it's going to yeah i don't think it's going to end the way they expect i okay. would hope i'd hope that there there would be an online component of it but as someone who used to make a living writing for magazines of course, nonfiction, because I'm, you know, writing trash who doesn't write fiction on, you know, as I've been told on the line, you know, why are you on this show? But anyway. Oh, um, my God. Who do you talk to, Dave? <laughs> people hate me. <laughs> he shouldn't talk to anyone, probably. Yeah, I really, well, I try not to talk to anybody. It, it, it goes better. I talk to the cat, you know. Anyway, um, so I used to do a lot of technology writing um, back in the 90s. And back in the 90s is when this whole magazine market started to change. Where a lot of companies bought up other magazines and they greatly contracted the market. So I've I've been in this thing for a long time, and I this is a bad thing, but in a way I could I've seen it coming because number one, Barnes and Noble. Um, I've noticed over the years now my local Barnes and Noble closed about a year ago or more so. So I don't even have one near me anymore. The closest one's about 10, 15 miles away from here. Like I used to have one right, right up the road. And obviously borders, I used to have a borders right up the road too. That's obviously borders is long gone at this point. Uh, I would say when borders was open, borders was a much better place to find independent magazines than Barnes and Noble ever has been. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's you know, true. It, it, their we magazine selection was much better. And, and it all, I think it also depends on the, who runs the store. I'm not sure how much control the managers have over their magazine selection, 
but uh, I used to notice differences in some stores versus others. But I found, especially over like, especially since border close, borders close, um, I found that Barnes and Noble's magazine selection has it's gotten smaller when it comes to like smaller press magazines, whether it's fiction or or anything. It's it's more of the popular stuff, mm-hmm. and the magazine market has pretty much switched over to grocery stores and Walmart. And I think we all know that Walmart is is the bastion of allowing small press and weird ideas to be sold in their store. So <laughs> you know, we're not a problem. Oh, wait, no, you're screwed. Yeah, because they're never going to carry anything like that no. in, in, a, in a Walmart. It's just not – or a grocery store. It, like, you know, because people are like, well, I buy magazines at a grocery store. Okay, you must like, you know, either gun magazines or, or fashion Fine. magazines. That's, people all, like that's all they saw at my grocery things. store. Yeah. So now one thing, though, that, that – I, I I used to buy a lot of magazines, and I stopped a, a while back. And the reason why, and you're going to not necessarily think of this, is YouTube. Here's why. I obviously my thing is music. That's I make try to make money with music. So I used to buy a lot of music technology magazines. So the thing with the magazines, of course, is the lead time. You know, see a new piece of software comes out, guy writes a review. It's not going to show up for three or four months in a magazine. Now, if a new piece of software comes out, you just type that in the search bar. You'll pop up 10, 15 videos on YouTube of guys reviewing the software online. And you can watch them use it. You see the interface. You can watch them use it. And that's for anything. Like, like a, you know, I, I want to hear about a new guitar. I want. I used to cover trade shows for magazines. Again, three or four months till the article would show up. Now, like, people go to, like, NAM, which is the basically the music trade show, the big music trade show that happens in America every year. It happens in January. Right. I watch live videos from NAM. You know, I don't have to wait for a magazine. I can go on YouTube and watch a live stream, a guy walking around with a camera, going to various manufacturers and talking to them about their gear. It's like, it's killed, to me, it's killed that business. I haven't bought a magazine in years. Like, I used to buy all sorts of music magazines, and, and I also do animation oh stuff. God, so yeah. I buy technology magazines. The same thing. Like, the obviously, this year is a screwed up year with with trade shows because nobody's having them because of the virus. But... uh NAB, which is National Association, National Association of Broadcasters, it's a big TV technology convention that happens in Vegas every year. That was supposed to have been last week. So a lot of the manufacturers were doing live streams from like their office. So I was watching new product demonstrations on YouTube last week. You know, again, it's the immediacy factor that completely has killed that portion of the magazine market. Um, now I don't have a books a million anywhere near me. I've like I've never been in one. Do they sell magazines? Yes. Okay, because I, I honestly don't know anything about them, but I maybe they can pick up the slack. I don't know now, what their selection is like. Walk in, it's magazines, merchandise, coffee. <laughs> I don't get okay. that, but okay. Yeah, well, yeah. And then you know, all the books are this way. Yeah. But we can't, we can't not have magazines. And speaking of music magazines, do you have any idea how much different my life would be if the centerfolds and all of the circus and hip paraders and everything else that got me through the '80s rock and roll scene weren't pulled out of the magazine and stuck on my wall? <laughs> But yeah, you know, I suppose you could print a centerfold so. from uh from the internet now. But yeah, no, it, I mean it's a different same. thing. I don't, I don't think magazines are going away. I just think it's like it's going to be way, way harder um for independent magazines because they're not going to have an outlet. If Barnes and Noble is not going to carry magazines now, I have seen some talk that this is just a temporary thing. While the virus is going, on, while their stores are shut down, they might start doing it. I have a feeling that this is not – they're not going to keep selling magazines. I just – I don't see it. Their stores are in trouble anyway. This is just another way to save money and give more space to sell, you know, notebooks, pens, and beehives or whatever the hell else they sell in their stores. T-shirts store. and posters. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of our comic book but if you don't, Yeah. If you don't know where what the magazine is, though, that's right. who's going to lose out. Well, see, if that's right. If you don't already know what you want. You yeah. have no way to browse. I used and to go yeah, in borders and the, the borders, one of the borders in my area had a massive, I mean, massive magazine section. Like it was enormous. And I would find all sorts of weird alternative small press music magazines and stuff that you would never, ever find anywhere else except maybe in a weird record store, which you know, record stores don't exist anymore either. Um, and, and that was really cool. And there's, there's not, like you said, there's not going to be a market for that. And it sucks. And sure, you can get this stuff online, some of it. And it's certainly easier for somebody to like, hey, I got an idea. I want to make a magazine. It's way easier for them to make a website than it is a magazine and way cheaper. So, 
but then you have the marketing thing where like, well, how do you find out about it? Like, unless you're wired into that particular community, you know, I I always hear from people like, where do you find all these weird bands that you listen to? Because, you know, I like weird music Uh, because I'm wired into communities that I've been involved in for, you know, 30 years at this point, online communities where we all pass bands back and forth. Like, how have you heard this now? And obviously, you know, YouTube makes it way easier to discover music than you could 20 years ago, you know, before the advent of even Napster. But again, there's no, I, I think even if you're wired in that community, that's a very, very small subset of people. Like the average person who goes in a bookstore that might like horror, for example, and might see a weird small press horror magazine, like, oh, I'm going to check this out. Oh, that yeah, Bob finds these on every year for Christmas. Yeah, no, it's it's weird, bizarre short story magazine that we didn't know existed. Right. And, you know, we find that and we're like, oh, well, yeah. okay, we need more of this now. That that market is screwed and I feel bad for those people and I just feel bad in general. I think magazines, even though I don't buy as many as I, I certainly I used to have a I used to buy like maybe 15, 20 magazines a month for different technology things I was into. Um you know, I don't, I, I don't do that anymore necessarily. I still buy something occasionally if I, if I happen to be a place that sells a magazine I want to read, uh, which is not the grocery store. Um, but I, I feel bad for people that won't be able to discover new cool things. That's always like one right. thing that bothers me is, is like, you know, I, 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 it bothers me that people won't be able to see these things, you know, and easily well, access and with- them. With the loss of magazines, you don't just lose the main portion of the magazine. You lose the little nods that we see in movies or in stories where, you know, they make some comment about the story, the ads at the back of a magazine. Right, right. The whole generation is going to come in and not have a clue what the hell that's about. That's true. Yeah. See, I mean, I can see with the, the immediacy, like a magazine reporting horror news you know, you can get it online, you know, you can get, like, you just look up horror news and a whole bunch of things pop up, you know. Um, like this fiction, podcast. Like this podcast. <laughs> the, the fiction you'd hope would, would maybe have a little bit, because the small press in general arose as a response to the cra- the horror crash in the, um, the late 80s, you know. So, I, I, you know, because it is a thing that sort of emerged as a way to save horror just it's it's sad to see you know that it's it's like it's livelihoods being sort of threatened here that but you know maybe maybe if it is fiction it'll it'll go on like what do you think matt um, i just pulled a teacher <laughs> thing on matt i totally did i'm sorry matt was I, just, I just totally called on you in class you did you yeah, told I was just a- <laughs> 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 um <laughs> I, I guess I I fit that demographic of people that probably have, are in that age range where magazines might not have been that big of a deal in their lives, possibly. Because um, mm-hmm. for me, there's only one magazine I think I get anymore, and that's uh, Electronic Gaming Monthly. Now, granted, when I was a kid, there was a bunch of other ones that I used to get. But, you know, you read one, you read them all, essentially, <laughs> as far as that goes. but. I mean, like Dave said, he had those magazines that he listened, uh, read for, uh, you know, uh, music and everything. When I was really into uh, learning guitar and everything, I had all the metal magazines and they had, you know, the huge sections in the backs that, that gave you all the licks and stuff to learn the songs. And, you know, those were great. But at the same time, we are hitting that age now where, you know, all that can easily just be put online. So, so is this just essentially music went from vinyl to eight track to cassette to CD is, is this just going to be the next to MP3, I guess, uh, to digital, you know, music eventually left the print world. You can still get it, but most people just do digital. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I do vinyl digital. though has made a ridiculous comeback. So maybe magazines will come back. Like in yeah, I, I don't think the magazine market is going to go away. I, I I just don't see that happening. I just think that you know the bigger magazines will survive, obviously, because they get you know distribution to grocery stores and Walmart and Target and places like that. It's it's you know without I say without a bookstore component, the small press, the smaller magazines are completely screwed. So yeah. um, all I I mean if if you're into the smaller magazines and and the things. 
and you have a books a million near you, I would start bugging them to start carrying these magazines. Seriously. Or if you have a smaller magazine, I would, you know, start finding out who to talk to at that corporation because I think that's the only way you're going to have any sort of success because, I mean, that's the only other bookstore chain I know of, you know, that exists at this point, you know. Well, see, that that raises the question then, too, it, because I think you brought this up, Dave. If the magazines are going away, it's really kind of uh, an Im- implication then that the bookstore might be going away, and that's bad all around for writers and readers, you know, oh, another yeah. bookstore closing down so well i mean we've talked on this show i mean mary you've been on the show for i don't know how many years at this point but no, i'm not even sure anymore <laughs> yeah but it's been a while you know matt and kelly are more recent additions but i mean brian and i i think episode two or three we're, was talking we're talking about the failures of barnes and noble we've been talking about that right. for six years you know and if you read the news barnes and noble has been having you know, financial difficulty and been trying to solve the stores and, mm-hmm. um, you know, now given what's going on with our economy now, I, I will be stunned if Barnes and Noble, I have made this prediction before in the show and have been wrong, but I'll be stunned if they stay around just because they've been having financial difficulties right. and, you know, this the economy now is screwing everything up. So, um, and it bookstores going away is bad. Yes. <laughs> it's very bad. Um, now granted I, well, this is a rant for another day, but I, I basically, at least two years ago, not more, I basically stopped buying things. Um, <laughs> no, 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 but that can't be this, a is, good thing. this is just, well, it's just a personal thing with me. And then, you know, I got cancer and that totally screwed up my life. Um, but um, I like not being able to, there. not being able to go and browse in a bookstore and, and find things. That's going to suck. <laughs> yep, right. You know? well, part of the part of the fun of shopping is window shopping. Yeah, and- exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's And you know how many books I own because they were bizarre and I had to have them and yeah, I Yeah, I'm the same shelf? way. Yeah. I'm the exact same way. I would go to the bookstore and I'm like, "Huh, this looks interesting." And I would just pick it up, you know. Um I mean, I, I suppose you can do that online, but it's not the same. You know, looking at book right. descriptions and stuff, you're, you're not – and I guess this is, you know, me being old or whatever. But, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not like I don't have ebooks because I have a, a an iPad that has – you know, I, and I buy ebooks on it. You know, certainly whenever we did book club, which I think we should bring back at some point. Um, yes. I would always get the ebook because it's easier for me to read because I can make the text bigger if, you know, because I have terrible eyesight. So I can make the text text bigger on the screen, you know. So ebooks are great for that, but I still have and plenty of, and still occasionally get regular books because I like holding the book, you know, and and having the book. And certainly, like you go I somewhere like, like the way dead trees smell. You go, well, I, you know, yeah, it's a whole thing. And and you know, like if you go to a convention like Scares of Cares, you know, it's cool to buy the books and get them signed. And, you right. Know, I have a ton of of autograph books and, and things like that, and you know, meet the people and. Like I could, you know, you look at it like, oh, I remember seeing this guy at this show or, you know, like somebody like Brian, who usually writes something amusing in the book. That's always fun, you know, and it that kind of thing would suck if you couldn't, you know, go somewhere and buy books and, and, and stuff. So um, I have to admit, I do like signing books. I do. That's one of those things about being a writer that really hasn't faded. Like I enjoy signing books. I got like, to sign a magazine like one time in my career. Yep. Some guy was like a huge fan of mine, which I'm like, really? <laughs> and he happened to have a magazine. He, he had a mag. I was at a trade show, and he had a, one of the recent magazines he had written. He said, like, "Oh my god, read your also And he actually assigned me that. And at the same trade show, I, a review I had written for a piece of software. The guy took the final paragraph of the review and blew it up into a giant like poster and had it right at the front of his booth with my name on it. Nice. <laughs> that was really cool. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, I said something intelligent. You know, I should have taken a picture of posterity to show something. Look, I once said something smart, you know, right. the, show, the show certainly so shows no evidence of that ever in six years. So, um, but yeah, no, I, I, this is bad news. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about good news then. Okay. Now, the only good news I found, uh, because oh. the other thing, you know, speaking of the economy, and entertainment and stuff is that so many movies um i don't know so much about video games maybe matt can can tell us more about that but as far as like movies go, television games everything's been pushed back you know everything's been bumped to next year the year after 
you know, all of the all the filming and we've already talked about on the show the the disaster that comics is in right now. But one thing I did find that I'm really kind of excited about, we've talked about Train to Busan, the movie, yeah. the zombie yeah. movie on the, the show. Best zombie movie ever. Right? And so, I will fight anybody that disagrees with me. <laughs> it was directed by and again I I apologize for massacring uh the Asian names here. Yan Sang Ho. I believe um, that's how you say it, yes. He, if you have not seen this two, 2016 movie, you really need to. It is a fantastic zombie movie. And I say that living with the zombie guy. So if there is a zombie movie, I have seen it. Um, <laughs> sometimes against my will. But uh, <laughs> it was reported that this guy is going to be directing a horror series, a supernatural horror show for Netflix called Hellbound. I'm super excited about this. Apparently it's about these um, supernatural beings that start attacking people and dragging them to hell. So all of these weird religious cults start springing up thinking that these are like emissaries. These beings are emissaries from God. And I think it's going to be, I mean, just to see what this guy does next, you know, like so, oh, you're really impressed with the director uh, you just kind of want to see what he's going to do next. And I'm interested to any kind of time there's a horror show, which suggests to me sustainable horror. I'm very excited. He's also doing a sequel in the same universe as Train to Busan, a sequel to Train to Busan called Peninsula, which is set four years later. And it stars Gang Dong Wan as a soldier who managed to get out of zombie infested South Korea, where the government has completely collapsed. Um, but he's being sent back to retrieve something valuable. So I'm very excited about this. I, I think I, you know, I, those two things seem to be going forward. Anything, I mean, I think, and you guys, you know, you guys can, can tell me what you think too, but I think that the, just like this is, you know, just, just like this virus has affected the economy, the way we do things. And that some of these things are going to stick even going forward, even when things get back to normal. I have a feeling that streaming, which was already heading toward being, I think, bigger than having movies in the theater. Um, I think this is this is going to become a more and more popular thing um, where where this the content for streaming services is is going to become, you know, probably more stellar than anything you're going to see in a movie theater. I think that's already happened, honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some of the some of the Netflix original films are better than <laughs> things I've seen in the theater. Uh, for example, they just put up one last week called Extraction that stars the guy. <laughs> is his name? Yeah. Thor. I think the guys. I'm Thor. terrible with actor names and celebrities, but oh, I think oh, Chris, Chris Hemsworth. Chris Hemsworth. Yes. Thor. It's he's good. a guy. He's so a mercenary cool. <laughs> that has to res rescue a kidnapped kid. A drug dealer kidnaps another drug drug dealer's kid. This movie is phenomenal. It's also it's basically two hours of gunfights and explosions. So I'm instantly entertained. Um, but it's good. a really really good movie. And again, it, it was made for Netflix. Um, you know, and and I mean, it's it's like anything. Like you know, it's like movies. Like you know, some are great, some are not. Netflix is the same way. Some of their shows are amazing. Some of them are terrible. But um, we were having this conversation the other day. Uh, and again, I know a lot of people because I used to work in Hollywood. So I know a lot of people still that work in film and TV. And, and the conversation is, and this seems like an odd thing to say, but what's going to happen when Netflix runs out of new, new stuff? Now, we all know Netflix is show. packed with TV shows and movies. There's like more on there than you could ever watch in a lifetime. But. Everybody's used to new shows and movies every week being added to Netflix or Hulu or what any of these streaming mm -hmm. services. Nobody's making anything right now, and yeah. we don't know how long this is going to be shut down. I mean, it's still a mystery. What's going to happen when you go to the what's new on Netflix and there's nothing there, you know, <laughs> yeah. which, you know, is a weird thing to think about. But, you know, I, I know they have things in the pipeline and stuff, but it, it's something to think about. Is that going to hurt their subscriber base? Or are people going to say subscribe because like, I have nothing better to do with my time, that kind of thing. Um, no, no, I don't think it will hurt them because Netflix has a big, huge chunk of people who go back and rewatch series. 
That's the interesting true. thing about that, for example, I know for a while the most the, the most popular things that Netflix doesn't typically release any sort of data about anything, okay. yeah. but I guess there's ways to get around that. People have found the two most popular things on Netflix were Friends and The Office. Yeah, and they're losing both of those to other streaming services because now, of course, everybody has to make a streaming service because everything needs to be like cable or it costs ninety million dollars a month. You know, which is another complaint that I have. But um, yeah, I don't see all these services succeeding. But you know, because people just can't afford all of them. But um, be absorbed it, into other ones, just like the publishers. You well, know, I, I I'm like you know I I I know everything is about squeezing the last dime out of everything. But I'm a lot of times I'm like instead of starting up a, 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 your own service and going into all that infrastructure, just license your stuff to Netflix and get checks every month. Mm-hmm. I would think that would be easier. But what do I know? You know, I'm not a greedy pain in the ass. So, um, but yeah, I know there's people that watch the same stuff over and again. But I do think that there's a chunk of that market that's like. I, for one, and this just might be my thing from being sick for so long, I I don't watch things that I've already seen. I don't – I have I used to watch movies. I've, I've kind of stopped doing that. I don't reread books anymore, and I think it's because I decided I don't know how much time I have left on Earth. Mm-hmm. I told myself a while ago, and this, again, this is me, that any time after my, – if my surgery was successful, because going into it, they didn't know if it was going to be successful or not – Anytime I get after this bonus time. Now, of course, bonus time is now the apocalypse. So, you know, <laughs> keep climbing on my part. You, Dave. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm a genius. But, um, but I'm like, I want to experience things I haven't experienced before, you know? Right, um, right. And I know some people, they, they like Brian, and I'm not saying they're bad about Brian, but he likes to watch certain TV shows every year, you know? Yeah. He'll watch The Sopranos or Californication and stuff. And, and that's great. I love those shows too. But I'm like, I don't know much time I have left. I mean, none of us do, but you know, I was faced with, you know, Hey, you're not, you may not live much longer. And I'm just, my mindset is I want to watch or experience things that I haven't experienced. I want to have new experiences. So I think, you know, whether it's because of this reason or just in general, some people, I I know a lot of people that they'll watch a movie once and never watch it again, you know, that kind of thing, which I used to think was really weird, but I get it. Um, I think there's a, a chunk. I don't know how big a chunk of that audience is that will be like upset when there's not new shows on the streaming services. So I think it's something where, as far as you talking I about think the streaming the train- will change though. I think that when you look at the apocalypse, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, but you, if there's if there's no new movies coming out on Netflix. And you hop over to YouTube, people are just recording themselves doing crap. You know, take TikTok and make it bigger. Oh, and that's what people no, no, are no, going to no. do. TikTok, TikTok is the devil. It, it is. And I say this, it is, I may that's, know somebody that lives the in this house. Gonna do. They're just going to record themselves doing stupid shit and people are going to watch it. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I, I want TikTok to to explode. And it's well, not because it I live with somebody who watches it all day long and then you know, sends me links to cat videos and, you know, I don't, uh, I don't understand the record everything I do for the world. I've never understood that. I'm gen X. We trust no one. The hell if I'm going to record what I'm doing all day long and let weirdos watch me. <laughs> well, you know what though? Netflix is, um, and maybe this is good. You know, maybe this is good in, in a diversity sort of way that, um, they're getting a lot of content from other countries, yes. which is stuff that we wouldn't ever have a chance to have seen otherwise or even heard of otherwise. Mm-hmm. So I kind of like, you know, the, I, 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 I really kind of like, you know, scrolling through the, the like horror movies from Africa, horror movies from India, you know, mm-hmm. horror movies from Russia or, um, you know, like we watch a lot of the documentaries on Netflix. Yeah, he has we a lot too. of documentaries. Yeah. I bet you there's probably going to be maybe not quite TikTok type stuff, but maybe more indie film stuff. You know, um, I don't know. I think it'll be I think it'll be interesting to see the direction it goes in. You know, I mean, I can certainly see them going out and and access, you know, getting the licensing rights to more of that stuff because they're going to need content. I think that they they can't just turn the spigot off for you know they're going right. to need to have new stuff and and you know. Maybe independent films, you know, like, uh, you know, Mike Lombardo, you know, someone like that who makes a small mm-hmm. movie, you know. Now, I know his movie's on Prime, but uh, there's a ton of other people out there to make movies. You know, we've seen movies at, at conventions and stuff, and 
Yeah, you know, it's like anything. Some of them are not good. Some of them are really good. You know, like Lombardo's movie is amazing. You know, I'm not just saying it because I know Mike. It's his movie is generally like if I had never met the guy, I would say this is a really good movie. You know, so I, I, I for one would be quite happy. And I too do like the fact that, you know, there's a lot of foreign stuff, whether it's, it's, you know, TV shows, movies, documentaries, mm-hmm. stuff on, on Netflix and the other streaming services that you would never, ever have access to otherwise. And right. I think that's People a, that's a really stuff. good thing. German stuff, French mm-hmm. stuff, Belgian stuff. I mean, it's really, and, and I got to tell you, maybe it's, um, you know, societal or, or, or cultural or just their approach to horror. Maybe it's a, you know, spiritual thing, but, um, some of, some of their stuff is, I think, a lot scarier than what, you know, Americans are willing to do in a lot of their, or a lot of their commercial horror, you know? Right. So yeah, it, well, it's not jump scare. They don't, they don't do jump effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. it's not jump scare stuff. It's something different. It's yeah, something I know you're. Yeah. yeah, it's it's interesting to see, you know, that kind of stuff from from other places that again we would not have access to. You know, so that's that's cool. But um, my cat. I think it's it's going to affect more um, 2021 and 2022. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because nothing's in production, and um, if you look at the like the movie release schedule, um. In 2022, currently, they're scheduled to have one of those Marvel movies come out every other month the first half of the year. And I'm like, Dad, that's not going to work. Um, Moe's? Here's Mosby, by the way. He, he decided he wanted to walk on the keyboard because he's helpful. Uh, you mentioned video games earlier, uh, earlier by the way. Um, and Matt certainly could chime in on this if he wants because he may or may not do a show about video games. Um, but all the stuff I've seen, because you know I used to work in, in, in video games. Um, that doesn't seem to be being held back because those people, for the most part, can work out of their homes. Right. Yeah. You not know, not right now. Yeah. Um, not right. Everything that I know of seems to still be going forward. I play a game, Path of Exile, which is a free to play game, and it, it's ridiculously popular. And 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 they're in New Zealand, and they're all working from home right now. But the game, because they do an update, a big update to that game every three months. They're mm-hmm. still on schedule. The game is still running. The servers are still running. Like it's still going. They're just not in an office. But I, we talked about things that we hope maybe will change from this situation that we're in. I am hoping the one thing that changes is that our society, especially here in America, comes to accept the fact that you can work at home and still be productive and get things done. And you don't need to have some stupid manager hovering over your desk telling you what to do. Because I've worked at home most of my life. Because I freelance, and I'm telling you, the office work is the devil. Having to be around stupid people and listen to their idiotic conversations, and you know, it you get more work done if you're left alone. At least I know I do, and I, I do. I'm hoping mm-hmm. you know from that perspective and the perspective of you're not driving your car, you're not paying for gas, you don't have to buy fancy clothes. I I just you're think not eating out for lunch. You're not eating out for lunch. Yeah, it, it's, it's good but... for the employee, which of course we know in America the employee is. You know, not something we care about. But I've been working for home for a couple of years, mm-hmm. and I freaking love it. I run the office and the books and all the managerial stuff, and it's great. Well, it, I mean, if you read any sort of articles about business and stuff, it, it's always been the thing. That, oh no, no, people can't work at home. We need to have them in the office because we need to, you know, make sure they're managed and stuff. And I think this is proving that that's a bunch of crap. You know, mm-hmm. so. Let's, let's. Well, it's not. It's not completely crap because there are people who can't. There are well, people sure, there's, who cannot you know, function you without someone. Can't be like know. a surgeon at work at home, you know, because well, that would be interesting. But you know, <laughs> that's actually coming though because I I have a friend that works in the robotics industry and they're doing robotic surgery stuff for remote for remote yeah. surgery. In and fact, I think that's uh, become more common. But yeah, Sprout there's people Tools that when it develops that um, software. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the students there are the ones developing that software. So, does anybody have anything else to add before we conclude the horror show without Brian Keane? Um, I mean, so many things. So, (laughs) David, David, David. Oh, my God. Can we just hop back to Thor for just a hot second? Are you talking about that movie? We can always hop back to Thor. I cannot in good conscience let the world think that everybody involved in this podcast today thinks that that movie was, quote, great. It was. Um, I think it was a good put your head on a shelf hour and a half of gunfire. Like literally at one point about halfway through, I looked at Bob and I was like, how many bullets did they use in this movie? And he just laughed and said all of them. 
all of That's them. why it was great. Am I the only one who sees like Chris Evans or Chris Hemsworth uh, in a in a movie where they're not superheroes and expects them to do something superheroic? And it's like weird that they're just supposed to be normal people now. He's just Thor. And if he thinks he's not Thor for a good 10 years, he's wrong. <laughs> he's wrong. Okay, so we were playing this horrible game last night where Bob watches um, trailers and I tried to make my head not explode. Because, oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. But there was a trailer for, and I don't remember the name of the movie, but it was a cult movie where this, you know, prophety Christ type figure has all these wives and all these daughters and whatever and so the creepy dude in charge we're like four seconds into this trailer and I went no because they took the Game of Thrones Daenerys's hot guy and Which made one? him the creepy cult guy oh so in my brain he's like no 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 you're the Game of Thrones hot guy you can't be creepy cult guy this is unacceptable <laughs> unacceptable so Thor, at least in this movie, he was still, you know, a badass with guns, many guns, all the guns. Um, I'll throw this a movie out there then. Borrowed. Um, if you, if none of you have seen it, I would watch Underwater. Oh, well, I've okay. heard it was fantastic. Right. So this was me watching the Underwater trailer last night. So at the beginning, I said, "Okay, so it's the Abyss." Oh no! Wait, no. Deep six. Oh, wait, no, there's Leviathan. And then Bob says, and she's Ripley. Yeah. I, I don't know. I've heard and that is underwater. Really good. I've heard it was you're not, really you're, good. You're not far off with that, Kelly. The, it does mirror <laughs> a lot of those uh, older 80s movies that took place with like claustrophobic stuff underwater. Mm -hmm. And the main character does mirror Ripley a lot. There's actually there's some parts where. Like her in the trailer. Yeah, th there were some parts in the movie where, as I was watching it, I was like, oh, I, I see what they did here. Because th there was like a scene <laughs> where, you know, she's suiting up to go out and do something. And she's kind of just standing there in this white tank top. And she has, like, her underwear on. And then she's getting into, like, this big yellow suit. And I was like, this is just like Ripley getting into that loader <laughs> <laughs> before she fought the queen. Yeah. So it was like a cool homage. But... The monster that appears at the end, Mary, you would very much like this. I love And monsters. I'm just going to leave it at that. Oh, I'm very excited. Just because of the stuff that you're into, Mary. So yeah, It's a very <laughs> monster from the looks of it. Oh, I'm yes, very excited. Is. Yeah, we watched a horror movie the other night. Oh, no, no, I should say we watched a horrible movie the other night. Uh, What'd you watch? Yeah, well, <laughs> I should I should say, because we mentioned online that... that that uh, Phoebe might be here today, but she's taking a food safety class right now, so she couldn't join us. But I made the mistake the other night. I went on Amazon, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to scroll through, and I'm going to let you pick the movie. And she picked The Spy Who Dumped Me. Oh. <laughs> is that the Steve Carell movie? No, it's... um. It Mila, sounds like it should be. Is it Mila Kunis? Like, again, I'm terrible with celebrity names. Oh, yeah. Mila Kunis? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah Mila yeah. Kunis. And, and she's in a relationship with a guy who ends up being a, a spy, and it... And her and her roommate go off on an adventure. You know, it, it, her roommate is a comedian, isn't it? It's um. Oh God, what's her name? This is on Saturday Night Live. Kristen Wiig. Yes, I think that's who it is. I again, I'm terrible. We watch TV. Um, like Phoebe can identify anybody in a TV show and what TV show they've been on, and I'm like, I, I have no idea. Who this is you know, because she'll say, Oh, that's blah 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 from blah blah blah. I'm like, All right, I don't know. Cause I'm just really bad with the celebrity thing, but um. Yeah, I think that's that's who it is. The movie is god awful. It was painful <laughs> to watch. At one point, because it's one of these things no, where you don't Kate know. Kate McKinnon. Yeah, that's oh, who it McKinnon. is. That's okay. who it is. I love Kate McKinnon. Oh no, uh, it, whatever. It, the movie's terrible. At one point, they're they're, <laughs> they're like, is this? She's like, is this guy a good guy or a bad guy? And I go, I know who the bad guy is. She's like, who? The producers. <laughs> that's who the bad guy is for making this pile of crap. Okay, so once again. Phoebe is banned from the remote control because well, you know, I'm yeah. not allowed to pick movies anymore either. Brian no, says I was just gonna say she's not to the Mary San Giovanni level yet. Well, you know why? You know why? Because I have an incredibly low bar. <laughs> I will watch anything. So I'm, gonna let that hang. I'm just gonna let so that so many jokes can be told right now. But we're not gonna do it. <laughs> low bar, Mary. <laughs> yeah. I know. 
I know that a movie's not good, but I'll yeah, watch it anyway in the hope that it will get better. And it doesn't. Well, speaking of movies that are on Amazon, by the way, if you've never seen it, Shark Attack 3 is now available. <laughs> Is greatest. I'm sorry. This is the best movie ever made. I don't even know why they still make movies after they made this. They're like, we've, we've achieved perfection. I don't know why we're still you know, making movies, but it is available. On screen. It, it's been out of print for a really long time. Like, you know, I've shown Shocking. people the DVD. No, it, <laughs> all, right, all right. Well, end on a good seen. note. Okay. So that's the best movie ever made. Matt, what's the best movie you've seen lately? I mean, I'd say Underwater is really up there for me. Yeah. And that's just, it was. Probably the only movie I've watched recently, actually. Mary? I honestly, I'm sheltered in place with my parents. I'm up in my old bedroom. We don't have the Roku, so I've watched nothing but, like, serial killer documentaries on ID for, uh, like, two months now. And I have really lost faith in humanity. (laughs) Um, There is no good in the world. Everybody is terrible, and you're not safe anywhere. Wow. Yeah, Not there's a good note to, let, to end on. <laughs> wow. That sounds about right. <laughs> oh, Brian's never going to let us do this alone again. No. We don't have to invite him to the call. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that we figured out how to do it without him. We know how to do this. <laughs> it'll be the horror show without Brian Keene forever. <laughs> I said horror show. We'll let him start on Thursday. It'll go live. And then about 20 minutes later, it'll just... <laughs> <laughs> and the pirated show well I think we did an admirable job in Brian Keene's absence more yeah, we had less. some serious conversations today I think that you know I it, think wasn't, so. it wasn't completely us derailing the show for an hour which is no. kind of what I had planned <laughs> but we were really well behaved Dave yes actually we were we, yes. were. we, we talked yeah. serious stuff we had a few yeah. giggles it was all yeah. good no, Matt just oh. sat there stroking his beard. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a Bond villain there. He just needs a cat <laughs> on his lap. <laughs> and then his and then his puppy hopped up on his yeah. lap, and I'm like, yeah. excellent. <laughs> In the background, I'm just watching different uh, mod videos for Doom on YouTube. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching well. Twitter explode because yeah. I had to remind the universe again today: pay your authors. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it's very hard for some talk reason, about but... them very soon on here, Mary. Yes, yes. That'll be a good episode. <laughs> yes, we will come back to that. We will come back to that next week, um, where Brian may or may not be there, depending on whether we allow it. Because <laughs> that's how we roll. You might be down so. cleaning the spiders out of that porta potty. He's going to make you live in. So. <laughs> God, no. <laughs> we might leave the spiders there so you have somebody to talk to. <laughs> I am civil. It's like he doesn't even know me. <laughs> I am I am semi-civilized. I cannot be using some park's porta potty for the next two weeks. Okay. A half a mile away. I can't, even, I can't even I can't even go down that road. Okay. Goodbye, folks. Bye. We'll see you next Bye. Time. Bye. The Horror Show with Brian Keene is a production of the Brian Keene Radio Network. You can listen to this episode and all previous episodes for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play Music, and wherever else podcasts are available. The Horror Show with Brian Keene is written by Brian Keene and produced by Brian Keene, Mary San Giovanni, Matt Wilderson, and Dave Thomas. Our theme music is by Matt Hayward. Our engineer is Matt Wilderson. Check out his books on Amazon.com. If you enjoyed this show, you might enjoy our other podcasts, Cosmic Shenanigans, Defenders Dialogue, and Grindcast. To advertise on The Horror Show with Brian Keene, visit BrianKeene.com and click Podcasts. <laughs>